Now that we've learned long division and synthetic division for polynomials, we're going to take a look at some root theorems that help us to narrow down our possibilities when it comes to finding the roots that exist. The first one we're going to have is called the rational root theorem. And this one states, let p of x equal a sub n x to the n, a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1, all the way down to a sub 1 to the, uh, times x plus a sub 0 be a polynomial with integer coefficients. There are a limited number of possible roots of p of x equals zero. And the way we can find this limited number of possibilities is all integer roots must be factors of a naught or a sub zero. a sub zero, a naught mean the same thing. And rational roots, which are, if you remember right, q represents rational, are of the form uh, p over q, where p are factors of a naught, and q is a factor of a n. Any other roots that might exist would have to be either irrational or imaginary. This covers all of our rational sets. So if we take a look at the polynomial that's given, 2x cubed minus x squared plus 2x plus 5 equals 0. If we take a list of all the factors of 5, which are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 5, those are all of our integer factors possible for this polynomial. Then if we take a look at all the factors of our lead coefficient 2, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and then set up ratios of those. So we'll have plus or minus 1, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 1 half, and plus or minus 1 fifth. These are all possible rational coefficients or roots based on the coefficients of this polynomial. So how does this help us work things down to where it's more usable? Let's take a look at an actual polynomial that we want to factor. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use the rational root theorem to help us factor out 2x cubed plus x squared minus 7x minus 6 equals 0. And to do this, we're going to speed up the process through synthetic division. So we're going to pull out 2, 1, negative 7, and negative 6, and then we're going to place up here our possibilities. What are our possibilities? Well, we'd have plus or minus 6, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 1, which are all the lead numbers uh, coming out of 6, and then if we take each of these and divide them by the uh, factors of 2, well, 6 divided by 2 is 3. We already have that. 3 divided by 2 is new, so we had plus or minus 3 halves. 2 divided by 2 is 1. We already have that, so the only thing else would be plus or minus 1 half. Now, going through and starting to pick some of these to work from, ultimately I can select any numbers that I want to from this list to put in there. Uh, since it ends in an even number, I'm going to start with even ones. I'm going to start with the number 2 and see what happens. So first thing we do is we bring down our lead coefficient. The 2 is already there, and then we multiply. 2 times 2 is 4. Mul add this together. That gives us 5. 5 times 2 is 10. Add this together. gives us 3. 3 times 2 is 6. Add those together. gives us 0. Because we have a zero, that means that this was a root. I lucked out in this case. Now, the polynomial that remains only has three terms, which means it's quadratic. So I can either continue using the rational root theorem in synthetic division, or I can pull this out as its own polynomial. So I would have 2x squared plus 5x plus 3 equals zero. And I now have options for factoring this. Do we know a pair of numbers that multiply to 6 and add to 5? Well, the answer is 2 and 3. So I'm going to split my center term. So I have 2x squared plus 2x plus 3x 
plus 3 equals 0. Now factoring by grouping, I can pull a 2x out of the first set, leaving me with an x plus 1. And I can pull out a 3 from the second pair, leaving me with an x plus 1. Now this gives me 2x plus 3 and x plus 1 as other factors. So in the end, I will have 2x plus 3, x plus 1, what I just got from the quadratic, and x minus 2 as my factors. What are the roots of this polynomial? Well, it will be 2, negative 1, and then negative 3 halves, all of which are included in my original list that I made. And again, these are rational roots. We can have other ones that will be coming up that might not be rational. Let's take a look at a theorem for those. So the conjugate root theorem, and you'll remember we worked with conjugates in unit 4, the conjugate root theorem states something along the line of if p of x is a polynomial with non-rational roots then any irrational or imaginary roots will include both forms of that roots conjugate and what this means is that if I come out with something in the form of a plus the square root of b as a root then I automatically get a minus the square root of b or if I get a plus bi as an imaginary root, then I automatically will get a minus bi as another one. So it helps us to build more roots from a basic system. Example, if p of x is a cubic polynomial with two of its root and two of its roots are five halves and three plus two i, what is the third root? Well, based on the conjugate root theorem, we have to have the complex conjugate of 3 plus 2i. So that last root would be 3 minus 2i. Then the follow-up, what is the cubic polynomial p of x that has these features? Well, we know that its factors are x minus 5 halves, x minus 3 plus 2i, and x plus 3 minus 2i. Oh, sorry, x minus 3 minus 2i. Not a plus in there, another minus. So we can simplify this first one, getting rid of the fraction. This becomes 2x minus 5. Then we need to multiply through our second set. So doing a little work on the side, if I have x minus 3 minus 2i, just distributing that negative sign, and I multiply that by x minus 3 plus 2i, and then I were to distribute this out, I'd come up with x squared minus 3x plus 2xi minus 3x plus 9 minus 6i minus 2xi plus 6i minus 4i squared. Then going through and looking for opposite pairs, we have a plus 2xi and a minus 2xi, a minus 6i and a plus 6i. Remember the minus 4i squared is really just a plus 4. So now combining like terms, I have a second factor of x squared minus 6x plus 13. The 6x came from negative 3x and negative 3x and the 13 came from plus 9 and plus 4. Then we distribute this to come out with the final term, uh, in which case 2x times x squared is 2x squared. No, sorry, 2x cubed. 2x minus times a negative 6x is minus 12x squared. Keeping with the squares, negative 5 times x squared is negative 5x squared. 
Then going to our linears, 2x times 13 is 26x. Negative 5 times negative 6x is plus 30x. Negative 5 times positive 13 is plus 65. Now combining like terms, my n polynomial is 2x cubed minus 17x squared plus 56x plus 65. So if I'm given just these two original roots using the conjugate root theorem, I can reconstruct what the polynomial p of x originally was. So conjugate root theorem takes quite a bit of practice getting in there. Uh, we have just one more, and it talks about the positives and negatives. So Descartes' rule of signs states the following. If we let p of x be a polynomial written in standard form, the number of positive real roots of p of x is either the number of sign changes of p of x or less than that by a multiple of 2, and the number of negative real roots of p of x is either the number of sign changes of p of the opposite of x or less than that by a multiple of 2. Now, these sound like they're saying the same thing, but let's work through a problem. So, if my polynomial is 2x to the 4th minus x cubed plus 3x squared minus 1, if I were to substitute in an x, it would look exactly like this. How many sign changes do I have on here with x? So, p of x, number of sign changes, I go from a positive to a negative, a negative to a positive, a positive to a negative. So that gives me three sign changes. That means I have either three or one positive roots. Then, if I were to go through and work the same thing using p of the opposite of x, so if I went p of the opposite of x, what happens when we raise a negative to an even power? Well, we would still have a positive sign, so I still have 2x to the fourth. What happens when I raise a negative to an odd power? It becomes negative, so this becomes plus x cubed. Raise negative x squared, I'm still going to get plus 3x squared, and then I'll have a minus 1 at the end. So this means that all I have is 1 negative root possible. So I either have three or one positive real roots, and then I have one negative real root. And if we were to take this and graph it on our graphing calculator real quick, now when I do this and put the graph on, it's going to cover up these answers, but I come out with a graph that shows one positive and one negative real root. Other roots might exist, imaginaries, but they are not real. Let's try it with the next one. First, if my function or my equation is x cubed minus x squared plus 1, we go from a positive to a negative, and then from a negative to a positive. So for p of x, I have two sign changes. This means I have 2 or 0 positive real roots. Then if I were to substitute in a negative, p of the opposite of x would give me the opposite of x cubed minus x squared plus 1. Raising a negative to an odd power gives me a negative. Raising a negative to an even power gives me a positive, so the sign would keep the same. I have only one sign change, <coughs> so that means I have one possible negative real root. Then again, if I were to go through and graph this, I come out with this graph and it shows only one place where it crosses the x-axis. Being an odd function, we can have at most two turnarounds, and you can see I have one, two turns, so it's not going to turn again off the screen. So between Descartes, 
our conjugate roots and our rational root theorems, we have a way of limiting down the number of possibilities. As we move further on in our study of mathematics, we're going to revisit these concepts and expand upon them, but that typically is reserved for more of a pre-calculus level mathematics course. Make sure you have these down. They are going to be helpful in this unit, and we'll continue to build on these concepts.